Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of Chat. My name is Brian Kearney. Absolutely delighted today to be joined by international DJ Ben Nicky. Ben, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. Um, I literally just come back from the gym like yourself, so sorry I'm a bit like not dressed up for a bit. Yeah, no, it's all good, man. It's probably one of the hottest days of the year as well. So uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, come to the podcast today in a, in a nice sweaty studio as no well. No worries, man. No worries. No worries. So how are you keeping? Um, I'm not too bad, mate. Um, I actually just experienced something really weird about 10 seconds ago. In my garden, is uh, there was hay falling from the sky, like Jesus. proper from the clouds. And um, it's apparently called uh, a hay tunnel, which is really rare. And um, when it's really hot, like the fields, they send up in a tunnel, like a tornado, hay. And there's hay falling like it was like a UFO thing. I was, it was crazy. It's on my Instagram. I just put it. It's mad. Like, yeah. Okay, now. Yeah, because you um you only recently moved to the Northern Ireland from the from England. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I just moved over. Um, I was just sick of um living. I lived near London just because yeah. I was at the airport so much, like yourself. And I just was living there for the reason of going to the airport. So all my friends live over here, and obviously got a like a career does really well here, and just got loads of friends here. So I just uh just enjoy living in the country now, mate. Just uh, animals everywhere, and. Um, rabbits in the garden and hay storms so it's great nice one, nice one. and uh, where um, how long is it that you're living there um, about four months yeah four months yes. right from like I uh, moved in January just lockdown I'm sure for yourself has been a, a good chance to kind of get my home life sorted and like kind of a few priorities in my normal life uh, yeah. so I kind of just took advantage of that really yeah, so like, um, how how did you find that moving, um, not even just moving house, but actually moving country during lockdown and, and everything that we've been going through? Was that a difficult process doing all of that? Yeah, I've actually, like, I'm quite a spontaneous person. So like, I just like do things randomly. And um, I was just over, um, two of my friends that live here, I was over visiting them in December, kind of when lockdown wasn't as bad. So I can kind of like go and visit one friend at a time. Um, and we just, um, decided I went, I saw a house, loved it, had loads of land with it. Um, as you know, obviously being down South as well, the amount of, amount of greenery everywhere, once you move over from England to this side, you know, it's, there's so much greenery everywhere. Um, all the way from up here and all the way down, even when I go down to like, you know, down to Ireland to Dublin and stuff like that, like there's just, just, it's just a beautiful area with loads of land. And I, I just love just I just wanted to do it so I just um just made the choice and I uh, did it pretty quickly actually within like two months like I kept my house in England and rented it out just in case I want to move back but um yeah I just just had to be done man fair place here you're enjoying living in North Ireland anyway but it sounds yeah I love it yeah. love it nice one nice one it's good to hear man and uh good to hear you've settled in really well over there so Obviously, man, the, with the profession that we're in, we've been through a very, very difficult eighteen months. Um, very curious to hear how you've you've handled it because you're Jesus, man. You're one of the busiest DJs out of all of us. How have you um, found everything that's happened over the last eighteen months? Have you found it difficult? Um, to be honest with you, I think just going from um, and I obviously speak to loads of DJs like we all do, so I think we all kind of relate to this. But from going a hundred miles an hour nonstop for a good. 10 years i'd say like and I, I never really had a chance to ever really reflect on normal life so um i think luckily there's you know there's a few of us who obviously done this as a in, in a very uh, professional way for a long time where you know it's our it's been our main job for years um i didn't ever want to put a negative on the situation and you know because there's so many amazing talented djs who we know out there that haven't ever been able to make it this a full career and probably haven't survived this period very well financially uh, and for clubs as well like some of our favorite clubs have all closed down and stuff like that so it's been really hard but i didn't ever want to like be you know try and you know be upset about it publicly or anything because at the end of the day like i've done well from it for music really well uh, but still i've you know lost friends during this pandemic as not just from covid but from personal you know suicides things like that which you know are down to, you know to do a lockdown so i'm kind of neutral in terms of um you know I've, i haven't really took sides in terms of what i believe you know is right for me i just know that i did well before this lockdown and i've managed to stay pretty sane during it but i'm also aware that it has very bad costs uh, you know, continuing, you know, going through being locked down. Um, so does obviously COVID as well. So I've kind of just stayed on the fence of it and kind of, I've got friends that are on both sides of the camp. But I, I've, I've kind of like tried to be as positive as I can through it. And obviously, like you said, is I was, I've been really busy for a long time and I was on the verge of 
pretty much like having a, I wouldn't say a breakdown, but emotionally exhausted uh, before this all happened. So I kind of, anyone who knows me well knows that I needed this, uh, not to the extreme that's happened for all of us, but I personally needed a break. So um, I kind of took a positive from it, so to speak. But, you know, like with yourself, I mean, we're just used to getting on planes every week. Um, and I found after a long time, I didn't really know who I was. I was just like on planes, playing gigs, you know, it's like the adrenaline's massive, going back, drinking a lot, rah, 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 um, and then doing it again. And you'd go home for two days, get jet lag, sleep. And then before you know it, you haven't seen your family, friends, relationships had suffered, and I didn't repeated it. So I didn't have a very good balance. And I know certainly coming back now, I will. And I'm intrigued to hear with you, with you the same, you know, how, how you felt during this. Yeah, it's really, really interesting that you say that because the last time that I saw you was at um, Tomorrowland 2019. And I remember I saw you in the, the backstage part where the catering and all that was. And I remember seeing you and it just looked to me like you were absolutely done. You were done in. You looked like you were completely broken. And I was actually going to go over and make sure, see if you were actually okay because you just looked like, you looked burnt out. That, that's yeah. exactly as you said. So, I'm glad that you've used this time as sort of a a time to sort of recharge your batteries, to focus on other things, because you're, you're completely correct in what you say. I felt exactly the same way at times with this job where you just feel completely burnt out. And there's been times where I've no idea who I am, like who, who's the real me, who's the DJ, all this type of thing. Yeah. And as bad as the last sort of 18 months have been, some of it has been probably some of the happiest times of my life at the same time. Some of it, not, not all of it now. Um, overwhelmingly, it's been very challenging and very difficult, but there have been times where it's been just been really good to just sort of find out sort of who I am again and to just sort of have a very simple, quiet life um, away from the madness that, that our job can entail at times, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's quite... I, I like to hear that because um, there's certain people... I think it shows quite a, a, a lot of character as well to stay strong in situations like that. And like you said, is unfortunately, I'm sure, you know, we've toured the world for a long time financially. We're, we're you know, able to cope. And um, I'd like to think I've got a smart business head. I made the right investment choices, stuff like that, and um, have continued to do so during lockdown and um, branched out into other things as well as DJing. Like I do my merchandise and um, investments and stuff like that. Uh, got a bit of an addiction to the stock market at one point, which wasn't healthy. Um, but I needed like a little bit of a, an addict, addicting thing to do every day that kept me going. But apart from that, like, I just think that like, I do really feel like going back to things. Like I'm really trying to help others in the scene kind of come up now and not just a personal gain. Like before, you know what it's like in the scene, like there's yeah. DJs that all have, you know, they only help other DJs if they're benefiting from it, stuff like that. And, you know, if they own an artist, but for me, like I'm really just trying to help some other people come through because I noticed how much people had lost during this period. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got some friends that rang me and, they, you know, they couldn't even go by a month without struggling. So like for me, I, I just feel like, now is the time to like you said we're now i'm about to go full throttle again next week and it's like okay like do i want to go back to how i was no i yeah. don't i'm still busy but how can i change what i was doing um but i was always true to myself like i was never you know when i was younger i had a bit more of a bravado about me and what it came into it being very different to traditional people in you know say trance music which i'm very well aware of um, but it also served me pretty well, um, you know, being a bit different from the norm. Uh, and now I've grown up a bit and we've, you know, as DJs, we've all grown up and grown through this together. Uh, now I'm like kind of know a bit more about what I want, um, which like you said, you have to try and find what you, what makes you happy. So um, I think, yeah, taking all this to account and moving forward, I think that like, um, yeah, it's, it's important to like know the direction you're going to go coming out of this. And um, like, have you, how's, how's your plans now, like going forward in terms of um, you know, music and gigs and stuff like that? I'm, I'm, I'm working away on a lot of stuff. Um, obviously, a state of trance is always for me the biggest uh, event of the year. But I'm seeing now that the clubs and the events in Holland have been, the clubs and stuff were back open. Um, but the, they're after closing them down again until the 13th of August. So I, I now I'm, I don't know. I hope it does go ahead. Um, I'm sure it will, but it's the uncertainty of it. it it's the hope that hurt, it that kills me, and it's the uncertainty that kills me. 
and it feels like sometimes I'm just sitting in the studio working on music going why, what am I making music yeah. for like what is the point it's it's just that's the most difficult part for me and I found yesterday a really difficult day because uh, I was offered two really big shows in America for next month or two of my, two, my favourite clubs I've ever played over there but at the moment America aren't um, they're not letting anyone in uh, from Europe to UK or from certain regions but you can apply for an exemption to be let in so that. I put together a big everything they needed and it was I was the client and it was just like, it just it, it, I had a really fucking bad day yesterday man I'm not gonna lie uh, I was um, driving in a car park and two kids came flying in front of me and if I wasn't paying attention I probably would have knocked them down uh, it was just yesterday was a, it was a really bad day and for me with this whole situation man it's as soon as I start feeling positive and I feel like things are starting to get better, I feel like it just gets worse again. So wh what is the point of me um, getting my hopes up? But y you make a re you made a really good point there as well. Um, I think beforehand there was a huge amount of competition and uh, sort of getting one up on everyone and he's doing these gigs, I want to do so that We need to forget about all that moving forward, man. We need to fucking support each other and... Like we're all in this scene together, man. And, and as you can see, with, with the, the actions that are being taken out on this industry in particular, the, the, we're not being given a chance to open up and have a chance and to work, whereas other sectors are. So when it does open back up, and I'm, I'm delighted that the likes of yourself, um, your gigs are starting coming back in. You have a massive show in Belfast uh, in seven seven weeks or so, is it? That's book, For yeah. me to see that, that stuff coming back, that gives me a buzz, man, because it, when I'm safe on my Instagram or anything else, if I see people playing at gigs, it, I get really jealous, but it gives me yeah. hope that, it gives me hope that it's coming back, but it pisses me off because it's happening in these places, so why is it not happening here? Yeah. And it's 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 just tough, man, but you have to just, you have to sort of block out as much of the shit that's going on as possible and focus on your own stuff that's going on in your in your day-to-day -day basis. So I'm, I'm just trying to look after my own health, I mean, physical health, mental health, just staying in contact with people as much as I can. Um, none of this is my fault. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. It's a global situation. I'm sure someday it will get better and we'll la look back and laugh at all this, but we're still in the middle of it. And as I said, it's it's just the hope. That's the part that, that <laughs> fucks me up the most, man. I think, I think as well, I think, when, when you said about, you know, things go back and forth. I think the issue is, is that the media, uh, mainstream media, they definitely obviously rely on clickbait. So, you know, the minute that something good happens, they want to say something bad because I know you're going to be like, fuck, and, and you'll click it. So I've kind of like started to learn a little bit to dissect that and be like, yo, I don't really believe it unless I see it in person. Um, and you are right. Like the, 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 the number one word you said was uncertainty. I think that's a problem with the music industry is that, none of us have a guarantee like my first shows next friday england's opening up on monday and we still don't know whether we have to do testing at the events the, the, it's down to the local council they haven't given an answer obviously legally we can do it now do it but whether we have to have um because the newcastle's got quite high covid cases right now so you would think you know have testing or whatever but it's like I feel like before we had such freedom, like, you know, we would just, I would be on a plane to wherever I wanted every day. If I wanted to go visit a friend in Vegas whilst I was in LA, you know, I could just go and do it. You know, done. It's if I wanted to play a gig here, 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 and I never had anyone tell me what to do, but I now feel that like quite claustrophobic with the whole, like, even if I wanted to go, you know, anywhere right now, I'd have to have two COVID tests, go to get a fit to fly past, like all this stuff. It's like, what's the point? Like, you know, it's, um, I just feel very much constricted. Um, I think there must, I would like that to come a, a point, um, where I take personal responsibility for my life. If I want to do something, then it's on me. You know, um, if you would like to, you know, not be around people because of COVID or you, you know, you're worried about, you know, big groups of gatherings, then you don't have to go. No one's forcing you. You can do what we've been doing all along, stay in, protect yourself. Um, you know, the vaccines are there to protect yourself if you want to have them. I've had one one of them so far. I haven't had both jabs. I wasn't really wanting to do it at the start because of the research. I, I waited a, quite a while. 
I've had one, but I had the other one. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm, like you said, I'm pro-choice. I'm not like tell anyone, yeah. anyone what to do. Exactly, had- exactly the same as me, pro-choice oh. on all of this. Um, as you said, like at some stage, life is going to have to go on. Yeah. You just see like some of the states in the US, they've just like Florida and stuff, they've just carried on as normal and, and they seem to be living fairly proper lives if you want to stay at home and if you're worried about this you stay at home if if you're worried about it you take a vaccine and and, and you're okay if you don't yeah. want to take it and you want to live your life you should be allowed to do it it's 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 just very very it's like you can't you can't be in the center anymore you can't be um you can't question things without being a conspiracy theorist lunatic and yeah. if like you, you can't you're you're either, you can't be you can't be either. That's the most frustrating thing about this. And you're completely so media with it as well. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I'm, for example, like if I made a like a like a informative post about some something that might have not be on the you know in the news, but something that I strongly believe happened, you then suddenly get your post flagged up or whatever. And it's like, you know, even. What, what happened to the days where two people sit in a room, you look at the, the pros and, you know, and against, and, you know, and you make a decision based on the research that doesn't happen anymore. You're told what has to uh, be believed. And um, unfortunately, like I, like I said, I'm not anti-vax. I'm not pro-vax. I'm just about tell me the facts and I'll act on it. And um, yeah, like I said, I've had friends that have had COVID really bad. Some DJ friends actually that have had COVID really bad. I've also had some friends that have been really ill from the, the vaccine. So in fact, one of our friends, sadly, in Canada died of the vaccine. One of my best friend's friends. So like, really? Jesus. Yeah. And it was, what, a age, new- what age was he? It was a, it was a girl. Uh, she was in her early thirties, healthy blood clot uh, from the AstraZeneca one, which obviously we know had bad press anyway, but that's why they don't give it to us. But again, if I went out and you know publicly said, oh yeah, this and that, I'd probably get a post removed. So, um, mm. and it's not because I'm, you know, we're anti any of that. It's just stating a fact. Um, and the way I look at it, like, you know, 500 people sadly die a day of cancer in the UK, but we still sell cigarettes. So I'm like, well, if you, you know, you wanted to try and stop things, people, other people getting sick, surely we would start there. Um, sorry, so my internet connection is unstable. Is that right? It's better now. No, you're absolutely fine. You're still, um, I can still hear you, man. It's all but good. yeah, so like, you know, it comes a point where, like you said, is we take responsibility. Um, COVID is there and clearly it's getting better. And our vaccine was the way out of this for, you know, for the UK specifically, obviously there's been a lot of um, push on it. And, you know, regardless of whether we are, you know, agree with it or not, a lot of people have had it quickly. So like, you know, if it, if it works, then clearly we should be able to live a normal life. Uh, cases being high doesn't necessarily mean deaths means which is nothing. what means it, nothing. It, exactly if the vaccine stops it turning to hospitalizations then what's you know what is the issue like you said before even if that wasn't the case just stay at home if you don't want to risk it get your food delivered by tesco to your door live off furlough you know for another few months and yeah, yeah, yeah. do what you need to do um but sadly it's people like us you know self-employed people that have had the, the brunt of it and i'm pretty sure our corporation tax will be going sky high to pay back all of this furlough soon even though we've been given nothing so mm-hmm. it's kind of like you know it's hitting the self-employed not just musicians just like in general um i've got some friends who have been getting 80 percent of their salary doing nothing and loving it because they haven't had to pay for travel to work and um, they haven't had to pay for food at work so they've actually made like a hundred percent salary really they've had no outgoing so they've they've loved it mm. so um yeah it's a funny one mate and it's uh you know these are debates that i don't really get into with people because it's just like like you said is everyone's got a different opinion but one thing that should uh be took from this is that we're all human at the end of the day and like we, we should all just get on and hopefully like get through this regardless but if there is foul play in the world like it sh- people should should be called out i think like what happened in england with like people like hancock and that like it's terrible like it shouldn't happen at all mm. yeah it's, and you're, you're you're speaking about the news and stuff like see there's, there's there's different generations there's like the the bbc generation where they where elderly people or people of a certain age will watch the news and they believe that what what's said on the news is gospel and, and it's not it's like we live in an in information age where there's there's plenty of counter arguments to everything that's going on yeah. and it just it's so hard you don't you don't just don't know what to believe anymore because it's just it's very for me it's very hard to make sense of some of the stuff that's going on at the moment like at the moment down here last night they voted into legislation that only people who are double jabbed or vaccinated or who have recovered from COVID are allowed to indoor dine. 
for the next uh, three to four months. What if you're allergic? What if you have an autoimmune disorder? What if people can't take it for certain reasons? What if um, someone's trying to have a family and there's concerns about that? Like, this, it, it worries me because is this an indication of stuff, a uh, little indication of further stuff that they're going to bring in? Like, it's <laughs> here's the mad thing, Ben. You can go and stay in a hotel and have a meal inside, but you can't go to... You can't book a table in a restaurant and have a meal there. And this is this island. This is hap. This is happening right now. Wow! I, I went down. I went down to um, D- Dublin because I get quite bad tinnitus. Obviously, DJ. There's um, there's a company down in Belfast. Uh, um, no, not in Belfast. Down in Dublin. Sorry, Belfast is on my mind. Um, down in Dublin that I drove down to, uh, and they have uh, like a a device that they think might help to cure one of the first in history, uh, which is like a new, which is quite exciting. So I tried that and um, we went for food after, well, we thought we'd go for food. This was only a month ago. So I went to, um, oh, it's just off the motorway. It's a big shopping center in uh, Dublin. I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's not far from like, if you come in back to Northern Ireland, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think on the main, it, it's, it's like, if you go down from Belfast all the way down to Dublin, it's a big shopping center. I mean, right. I just do come into Dublin. Um, but I went, I went to, uh, went to go get some food and, um, I saw these people outside, like eating on the bench. I was like, okay, cool. Um, and I, I'm not, <laughs> the window was like open. I knocked the window. I was like, I think it was Nando's or somewhere. I was like, can I get some food? And they're like, yeah, you need to look at the menu on the window, then call us from outside the shop and look at me and tell me what you want. I was like, Oh, so you mean a takeaway then? Can't I just tell you to person what you want? And then just give me it. And they're like, no, like you have to, there's like a loophole. You have to call us in front of the window, tell us what you want. And then we'll then hand it to you. I was like, what? And obviously I was just like, mate, I, I, I was like, nah, I'll just, I'll just get some of the garage on the way home. Yeah, like it's yeah. safe, but I can go to the garage inside and get exactly the same food that I wanted. There was like, there was stuff in there. Like, okay, like what's the point? It's just so strange. It, it's just, it's very hard to make sense of any of this, this stuff that's going on. And and week yeah. by week, it just seems to uh, get stranger and stranger. But you were speaking about getting the, the job. Did you have any sort of um, negative reaction to it? Um, well, I, I have, actually, I actually didn't know for a long time, but I've actually got quite bad allergies. So like uh, for quite, for a few years, I had like food intolerances and like certain foods made me feel sick. Um, and I just thought maybe I just ruined my body over the years and I was just weird and I was, everything was just messed up. So I did one of these um, tests where you get a, um, you basically take a few hair follicles, you just pull some hair out, send it in the post and they tell you over 800 things that you um, they test for. So I was allergic to dust, pollen, certain trees, uh, like dairy, soya, like all this mad stuff. And um, yeah, so I was a bit worried because I had these allergies that I know that autoimmune is, is slightly worse than what I have. But um, the vaccines didn't really seem to work that well with autoimmune people. So um, I had it. Um, I was super scared. Did you have to wait? Have you had yours? No, I'm wait. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait. Um, I, I sort of was up for getting it. But then there was like a, an information leaflet that went out in the post. And the line that stood out for me from all of it was the long term effects of the va- vaccine are still unknown. So me personally, I'd like to wait maybe six, eight months until there's a little bit of research done. And if if, if it seems to be a bit safer, fine. As I'm not anti-vax. If people want to yeah. take them, it's it's brilliant. F- I, would, I, I just I don't want to take it yet. That's all. I'm not, I'd never tell people what to do or anything like that. So for me personally, I just, I want to wait a while. If I was in this job, um, if I wasn't a a DJ or around people, um, I probably wouldn't because I'd live Mm. a quiet life in the country. You know, I'm I'm early thirties. It it would, whatever it would, it probably wouldn't affect me if I had it. So, um, if I wasn't in this job, I I wouldn't. And, um, obviously from the, after the vaccine, you, you basically sit for half an hour, oh, 20 minutes while they observe you. If you have a reaction, that is the worst 15 minutes of my life. I was going, Oh, my throat's hurt a little bit. Like I'm yeah, about to, yeah, oh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was, yeah, I was yeah. like giving myself a panic attack. Like it was horrible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the thing that I, that made me end up doing it is, um, I have, I just sit on TikTok and all these places watching all these bad reactions happening to people. And I was like, I'm never getting it. I'm not, you know, you know what I mean? You go down a rabbit hole and it's yeah. like, okay. Um, then in my head, I went, Ben, 50 million people or something in England have had it. If everyone, if 50 million people in England all took a pill at the same time, I'm sure there'd be some bad reactions. So, I kind of like thought of it that way. I was like, look, when you do something on that scale, it's going to be bad. Um, regardless, someone's going to have some effects. And then I spoke to my friend, Aaron, that lives in Miami. He uh, is involved in DNA altering 
uh, an mRNA, which obviously is one of how the vaccine works. Uh, he rang me straight. I told him, I said, mate, I'm not getting this. I'm not going to turn into a robot. I went with 5G or this stuff. <laughs> he, um, and he rang me and he said, mate, stop being a dick. He's like, I have worked. He, he works with Pfizer, the company Pfizer. He goes, first of all, Oxford. Yeah, you're right. Don't touch it. It's just, it, it's a shit show. It's a different technology. It is uh, the, the clotting thing. Obviously, with flying, you, the clotting is very important. Yeah, you, Jesus. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he was like, don't go there. But he had been part of Pfizer. His friends have worked there. And uh, what I learned is that the, the mRNA technology that they use, it's actually, people say it's been rushed or whatever, but that technology has actually been in process for about 10 years, 11 years, something like that. All that they do with the mRNA is they find anything, whether it's for hay fever, COVID, whatever, and they put that that antidote, whatever, they put it within the mRNA, which has had 10 years of research, and then that's how they do it. So it was only the actual co the COVID antidote that needed to be checked. It wasn't actually the mRNA technology at all. Um, what happened is Pfizer had, I believe this is what I've been told, and I have actually read it. Um, they they were like ninety percent finished on this on 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 this technology. And obviously, when COVID came out, the American government said, "Yo, we need a vaccine quickly. Here's all the funding you want. Finish it." So he's he you know, he's a legit mate. He's not like owned by anyone. He ain't paid off nothing. Like, um, and three or four of my other friends are very much into the medical world, and they said, "If you if you're going to," they're saying, "I'm not giving you hundred percent because we, it's your decision." But if you're going to stick with Pfizer. So when I went to get my jab, I said, I'm only having this. If you've got Oxford, I'm going home. And he was like, mate, we've stopped using it on anyone under 40. It's they're all Pfizer anyway. So I was a little bit better that if I've made the wrong decision, at least I've chosen like one of the, the, the better, you know, bad apples, you know? Um, and obviously being around people at work, um, you know, ne next week, first gig digital, you know, digital big club, sold out thousands of people, sweat everywhere and i thought you know what it's so ripe covid as well i don't know the effects of covid long term as well so i was like you know what like i if i catch it i've got quite a lot of well a lot of shows for july and august the end of july and august and so on just moving forward I, if i caught covid i'd have to cancel my shows for like uh you know a month and um i'd already let people down from postponing you know we had to postpone gigs because of lockdown so i thought you know what I don't know which one's right, but I'm just going to do this and um, I'll stick to it. I'll stick to it. And um, if anything bad happens, you know, like I grow a third leg or <laughs> my arm comes off or whatever, then uh, so be it. But I'm, I'm that technology that I researched, the, the whole protein spike thing, from what I saw, it's only in your body for like a day and then your body produces a spike and it reacts and stuff. So I, the Oxford one, I was like, nah, like I, I was like, nah, I'm, I'm definitely not. Um, but the other one, you know, who, who knows, you know, and none of us know, you know, I, I could, I've drunk a lot in the past. I could have damaged my liver doing stuff. And, you know, I just thought I'm just going to take this to keep myself safe while someone tall. And if anything bad happens, then it's going to happen to the majority of my friends and family as well, sadly. So, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a funny one, isn't it? How much have you missed that feeling of being on stage and the, the buzz that you get from the crowd? Um, in terms of going back to work, like, um, I, like you said, when you said you saw me at Tomorrowland look burnt out, I was getting to the point where it was becoming normal to stand in front of a lot of people. And I wasn't, you know what, you know, there's goosebump feeling you get before you get nervous, uh, mm. dress up and you, you can't even turn, you know, a frequency up and down because you're so like, you're, I remember my Argentina first gig, I was like this. Yeah. But as I was doing it more and more, and probably like you said, like to a point that most DJs weren't doing like stupid amount of touring, I think I numbed myself uh, from nerves. Like I wasn't getting nervous. Like even like my one here in Belfast, uh, Bell Sonic, like it's 15,000 people just for me. Like it, I should be shitting myself. Mm. Like, I was just walking up and just got on. And my friends like, aren't you nervous? I was like, no. And I thought to myself, that's weird. Like you should have some kind of apprehension or just be scared or, you know, anticipation for it. But I haven't. But I, I think that's just with anything. Like when you, you know, put yourself in a situation nonstop, you get used to it. But I'm really hoping that this break is like going to reset that. And I'm going to be more, a little bit more like, Oh, I'm a bit nervous tonight. So I am looking forward to it, but I'm also a bit anxious because I think things have opened up a bit too soon in terms of not duration wise, but we've gone from being totally strict to do what you want. And I, and I don't trust that. So I'm a bit, apprehensive of how is it too good to be true you know like you said about you know the dutch Holland, yeah two weeks are we going to close down 
I don't think so here because of the vaccination rate. I think there's no excuse if the hospitalizations aren't going up. I don't think they can do it. But like you said, they've done a U-turn nonstop. Um, so I'm just going to, the reason why my diary is so busy, it's UK to UK. So I literally can just jump on a plane for an hour, play as many gigs as I want and be home in my bed by Sunday night. So like, I'm not like rinsing myself jet, wise, jet lag wise, but I'm just going to cane it. Because if, you know, in two months of lockdown again, at least I can say, you know, I did it right for myself and I can just recover again. Yeah, you're talking. You're talking about things open up too soon, and like even even last weekend and, and Wembley, like sixty thousand people, and like the people trying to break into the stadium. And I've got a story about that. Yeah, this is what you told me in, in, in yeah. the message. So uh, obviously, um, must be a massive disappointment as as an English man for them to get to the final and not win. Uh, football isn't coming home. <laughs> um, what was uh, what was your experience of the of the final day? Well, like when I was younger, a lot of people know I actually played semi-pro when I know hardly anyone knows this because I was basically in denial. Like I, I didn't make it. I was sour about it. So I played for Bristol City, which is, I don't know if that's anything to be proud of, but Bristol City, very good um, academy. I was only until I was about 15, 16, uh, was a top goal scorer in all my clubs, etc. cetera. Um, and then when I was, I'm left footed, I played left wing. I was terrible with my right foot. Because of that, I got basically dropped from the academy and uh, luckily started DJing when I was 21. Worked out for me. But I kind of ignored football in general. Like even Bristol City, I don't follow them as much as I used to. So when England got into the Euros, I still fo follow international football heavily. Um, but when England got, you know, as far as they got, um, when was the final? Was it Saturday, Friday, Saturday? Sunday, Sunday at eight o'clock. Oh, Sunday, it yeah. shows how mad this was. Um, this is going to sound probably deeper now because it's a bit of a, stupid story but i'm gonna just say it because I, I just say what i think yes. my my friends my friends uh one of my friends over here she's quite well off she's got like companies she was in london and she was giving away tickets and i was like i want to go to the euros yeah. so she was giving them away so i ring her she goes ben i sold them two minutes ago I was like, oh. so i went i went to my mate ne my friend nico is quite a well-known youtuber up here he's uh he sells watches um okay. very big jewelry he does like rolex reviews like celebrities watches i'm um, really big following very big following in the jewelry world so i was like what friends have i got that will go halves with me to get to london i was like what friends have i got because i'm not going to go on a jet by myself i was like i'm not there's no point i've got a ticket so luckily i rang nico nico goes mate i can get us tickets for i'm not going to say how much but yeah, a lot yeah, 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 like yeah. stupid amount i can get us tickets category one right at the front by the press box all that i was like look mate once a life opportunity like this is a 3 p.m. by the way. This is already at three, and the game is at eight, and I'm in Northern Ireland. I'm like, how are we going to do this? Um, so Nico goes, I'll sort of tickets to sort of travel, which is not a great deal because the travel is way more expensive. <laughs> so he he sorts the tickets. Um, my friend Kyle, he, he's a, a farmer. He's got a helicopter. I was like, can you get us over? And he goes, Nah, mate. The wind is so bad. Um, so then I, I rang. You, I think you might know Matt Cheshire. He used to work for Paul Van Dyke. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Matt owns a private jet company. So I rang Matt. I was like, can you get me to London in time? And he goes, I can get you a flight out at half five. It's now three and get you a jet um, out. So we, anyway, so we did it. We got the jet, landed at 710 into something hill. It's not Heathrow. It's like the, it's for the private ones. So we, we got a taxi, then ran across the whole uh, of London, got to Wembley Park, got there at probably just after kickoff. Um, which I wasn't worried about because I was like, you know, I'll get in. Mate, we are sweating. Like, we just, you know, we just, we are sweating. We ran across. We didn't have a change of clothes, nothing. Like, we just hopped on this jet, tried to live up this amazing story and hopefully make it to the final. England win. What a day. Get there. Nah, mate, you're not coming in. What? <laughs> you're not coming in. I was like, why? Oh, the stadium's on lockdown. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean lockdown? Is the stadium got COVID? Like, what are you want about? <laughs> Is it a COVID test. Luckily, I had a COVID test because I was going to go away anyway, which proved I didn't have it. So we had our COVID test, everything. You're not coming in. Uh, people are um, have jumped the fence. I said, it's Wembley Stadium, mate. Like, you know, surely if you jump the fence, like that's not going to really affect anything. I mean, this is Wembley Stadium. It's like the home of English football. Now nah, you're not coming in. Um, and I, then I noticed there was lines of other people, bro, that hadn't got into the stadium, had tickets. 
you know, people, you know, I, I saw some person selling this ticket for 10 grand outside, you know, th these tickets weren't cheap. Mm. Um, and, and forget about me. There's people that have earned hard earned money you know, in a normal nine to five job that probably saved up their whole life for this game. Mm. Um, so we, we were, we weren't aggressive. We were fair. We went to like every entrance and they were just sticking to it. You're not coming in. And then, and then I started seeing, and I saw it in the news as well, that, um, People like at this, before we'd got there, there was footage. People were giving the security guards bundles of cash to get in for free. So they're saying that like the security guards were taking bribes to get people in. Um, so in the end, uh, it got to about, you know, it's about half an hour of the game left. I had a BBC iPlayer on my phone walking around, even though I had a valid ticket to get in. Just got off a private jet thinking I was the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sat there with it on my phone. And I went, me and my friends uh, went into the city to the, um, the Shard. Went and had a drink there. The penalties run. I was watching the penalty shootout on my iPhone in a bar. Like, and then I, the next day I humbled myself, got a back row seat on Aer Lingus. <laughs> so a bit of a different experience on the way home. Like, but, but mate, mental, like absolutely mental. I haven't tried to get a refund yet because when you buy tickets now, it's quite good on um, someone. If they have a ticket, they transfer it to you on the app into mm -hmm. your name. So it, it was still my ticket. So I haven't tried looking for a refund, but I might for a laugh just to see if I can get, you know, the value of it back. But yeah. Some mental scenes, some of the videos that I saw, yeah. like people breaking in and then the England fans like attacking them, kicking them in the head. Just like as much, much, much as um, one of the reasons I did move over to here and people always ask me, why did you move to Northern Ireland? Is I just, you know, of course there's, there's, there's been troubles in the past, that kind of thing. I, I don't get involved in any of that, but when you get into where the area that I live and, you know, the majority of here, it's everyone's just such a, a friendly bunch and a laugh. When I go back to England, as much as I'm English, um, some of the things that I heard fans saying to random strangers in the street, like some of the racist comments that, like I was embarrassed. Like I was genuinely embarrassed to be from there, at, you know, and I, I'm always, I always say you should always, you know, be proud of where you come from, you know, no matter what, but some of the things that, you know, that they, they should be embarrassed to be, you know, supporting their team because it was, it was, it was, it was just not on. And um, I think like you said earlier about things being censored and stuff. I mean, one thing that I've seen that really stuck with me is that if you write about COVID online, it flags up and it tells you to swipe up and whatever. But if you say a racist comment to someone, nothing happens. And why can't they filter that? Why, what, how is that so hard? Why can't you stop that? Clearly there's a reason behind that. And that's a worrying thing as well is if, if, you know, if you want to stop, football hate and racism and stuff why can't we build that into social media where you take accountability for what you've said you, you know what it's like being in the music industry as well in any in any essence you know if someone's been an idiot or someone's been highly saying something highly offensive or um racist or whatever then it should they should be accountable for it and um they're not but yeah if i talk to you right now about a job it would be swipe up you know it, so it, that, that's something else as well that i've actually really been thinking about the last couple of days is like how you know how how we're going being you know things that we say um, manipulate in different ways and that's not cool yeah and it's it's interesting you say that because the the first thing that went through my head as soon as the three lads missed their pen rashford sancho and saka is they're going to get horrendous racial abuse now online that's the first thing that you automatically think is going to happen and, and that was the case but when they score no problem no, no one says anything they're you know they're the best players in the team i'm, I'm you're happy and i, I think there was a headline that I saw. I think, I don't know what paper it was, but they'd even mentioned that they're like the three black players mm. have missed penalties. Not three players. They had to bring in. Yeah, they had to bring their colour, yeah. Why? why? Is that because it's clickbait? I mean, but why? I just, I don't understand. Um, obviously, you know, we've travelled pretty much all the world. Um, and I think with that, I mean, like you said, when we're younger, we're probably a little bit naive. But I think once you travel the world, you start to, you know, really, I think you start to accept and Opens love your mind. Yeah, yeah. All cultures like, you know, why, you know, why would I hate someone? Cause they live on a different part of the, the planet, which is all just one earth. Like, yeah. I just don't get that. So, um, yeah, I've always been a little bit annoyed at people, you know, in, in anyone that's, um, does something that's, that's not aim something at someone that's not their fault. You know, like if someone's done something wrong, you know, someone's murdered someone, someone's attacked someone. Of course, you've got a right to say, you know, you're wrong for that, you know, rah, rah, rah. But if someone's, you know, colour or, you know, the way they are, like, there comes a point where, come on, man, like, it's not cool. So uh, accountability is the one word that I, oh, I, I, I like to speak to, uh, speak about now and then. I think people need to take accountability for things that they've done because 
you know, being a DJ or whatever, if we did something wrong, we'd definitely be able to have to take accountability for it. Even if, we, even if we didn't do it, mm. if someone captures onto it, oh, you know, this happened, this happened, we'd probably have to take accountability or probably wouldn't be believed. Um, so, I mean, like, and everyone should have to do that. You should have to take accountability for what you've done. Um, and well, hopefully it changes, but we'll see. It's interesting what you say as well, because seeing as though you're living over on this island now, has your image of England sort of changed a bit? And I'll, I'll explain what I mean, because it's it's not here. It's not like f for people watching the final. It wasn't that they're, they don't want England to to win. It was just like it, it, it's just we always forget the impression that England think they've the game won before the game is even played. Football's coming home. And even from looking at some of the posts that some DJs had up about the game, they were declaring victory before the game had even ended. Um it's 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 so it, it happens every single tournament where they they automatically think that the the tournament is is won. And this is against Italy who've won the World Cup four times and they've won the Euros um once now it's twice so if football was coming home it was actually coming home to them because they, they far more success and um prestige at this level so it's just for for, for if for me as an irish person seeing that the way oh, you've been loving it. <laughs> uh, well this so the thing is i think the english side have a very likable group of players i think gareth selke is actually he comes opposed as a decent bloke it's yeah. just we i can't really say anything because ireland are still ce celebrating a couple of draws that they got at, at italia 90 with 31 years ago but like we're still hearing about the world cup in 66 and all this sort of stuff so if they were to win it again it would just be like that that's all happening all over again you know what i mean so i'm just giving it from, from my perspective but it was yeah. interesting that you said something similar that like some of the, some of the stuff is the carry on you saw and how some I know it's only some England fans yeah. were speaking to people and it, it's just interesting to see because I've I've seen other people say similar things that when they've sort of taken themselves out of the situation of being in England and they've seen how sort of the English media can talk about the side and talk about the team they sort of see things in a different way you know yeah I, I i think um for for someone um for someone to leave you know where they traditionally have lived i mean i have lived in other places other than england i lived in america for a bit and australia but um predominantly for someone to leave where they predominantly are from um even be it it wasn't i um didn't live in the town that i was from i lived near the airport like i said but to, to move to move somewhere very different you know very very different especially somewhere where you're very well known as well like you know, in, is over here. It's it's quite a hard to live a normal life. Yeah, you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your Amazon driver knocks on your door, and he's like, "All right, Ben." I'm like, "What?" They're like, <laughs> it, it, it's a bit weird. It's it's quite surreal, and I I never let that get to my head. I'm not about that, but I definitely I, I do think you're right. I think that um, as a especially in England, they really put pressure on the the media put pressure on the team from from the get go. You know, if they win, they're heroes. If they lose they're still done something wrong. Someone's done something wrong, you know? And, and like you said, everyone's got to miss a penalty. Like someone in the game has to miss a penalty. So um, I, I think that putting pressure on a situation like that is never, it's is never going to end well. And um, I mean, at Wembley, Wembley, when, when you're in the final for taking penalty, I mean, like, you know, can you imagine, like, I think Rio right. Ferdinand, I think being at Rio Ferdinand said, when I was watching it live, he said, I could not remember how to operate my legs when I mm. stepped up from a penalty. He's like, I genuinely had no idea what I'm doing. Um, and, and I think we have that stigma that we've always had. And I think the reason why we're, I wouldn't say me, I'm not overconfident with the football. Uh, I always quite, cause I, cause like you said, I've got mates that are in Ireland, Scotland, everywhere. And I get so much shit. Like during the Euros, they were like, mm giving me like my Scottish mates were like, mate, you couldn't even beat us. Like <laughs> yeah, these were as good as you. Yeah. And it's great. Like, cause obviously I, I yeah, I'm just, just take it. I love it. But um, yeah, I think we put way too much pressure on people nowadays. And the problem is, is when it all goes wrong is like you said, is, is you get the, you get the reaction that happened to the poor lads that missed the penalty. But at the end of the day, that, that they, they played a full 90 minutes and it's just one it's one kick it's mm. it's not that but um i i do feel sorry for people in that position and i think england 
obviously being they would say invented football that's what they've always said I don't know if that's actually the truth that we actually did invent football but they, they always say that I mean it was the home of football in terms of you know it's got a very strong league I think I think the problem with England is England has such a strong league and there's so much money the international football is never really related to it because most of our players are, are big foreign players that have got mad money um we've never really been like a top 10 in the world side for a long time that like we you know we've actually not performed that well for the last at least 10 years, really, I'd say. So, Do you think they did enough to win the final? Um, I think we definitely looked like, a, I think we definitely, especially in the Denmark game, I think we looked like such a strong side and I think we really um, took leadership. And I, I think normally, same being a Bristol City fan, I know this personally, the last 20 minutes of a game, normally I'm, I'm like going, I'm ready for us to mess up. Like I'm always like, right, we're winning. We're going to give away a goal in the last minute. I know it, that pressure always, uh, always gets to, teams that I support. But the, the funny thing that is with the Italy game, I haven't really watched it because I was on, obviously on the plane and then got to the stadium. I haven't watched it back, so I can't really comment on the game. Yeah, um, yeah I watched, obviously watched the penalties, but I didn't really watch the... In, in, I was obviously running around stressed out trying to get into this match. Um, but um, in terms of like the pressure and that, yeah, I think it, it's part of being like a... I think it's coming home nowadays is more like... Um, it's more of like a... The only, the only reason I don't hate it is that I think that it was in a time of COVID, I think it was great to see so many people from England actually getting on. Like before, obviously, all the rubbish happened at the game. I think just just having like a sense of pride, like for your country, regardless of if we agree, like, trust me, like obviously the English government are, are not no one, to, no one to be proud of. Like, you know, some of the decisions that they made are terrible. But just to be proud of like, you know, the football team. I thought it was great. And, um, you know, just, just seeing everyone proud of, you know, to, to see their football team do well. But... Um, unfortunately, you get people that let, let, let the side down. And um, I'm sure that's the same for plenty of other countries in the world. I mean, we obviously see it happen loads. I remember back in the day, there was loads of fights in World Cup and, you know, some countries were heavily involved and, you know, it gets press. But I think obviously that the British press are probably the most brutal and the most watched in the world. I mean, maybe, you know, we're, for a small country, it's a very, uh, like a very loud country, you know, like it's very much in the centre of, you know, of the world in terms of like finance and, you know, media and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just hope it doesn't happen again. I hope next time we win, mate. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think, I think um, in the World Cup, uh, England had a very, um, what would the word be, favourable draw in their route to, to the final oh. and, and they were beaten by the first decent team that they played, Croatia. And again, in the Euros, they've basically six home games with uh, Wembley, which were mainly just full of England fans. Made it all the way to the final again. I think they were a bit, they were far too negative in the final. Um, I think they could have scored too early, and they changed their game plan. They tried to sit back, too early, and yeah. Italy just sort of they, they dominated the entire game. Um, I think England had the best squad in the tournament by an absolute mile. Um, I don't think he utilised his attacking talent at all. He started with seven defensive players in in the final. It worked at the beginning, but I think if he went at Italy, they could have had them done by half time, but. I think some very, very good days are ahead for England in international tournaments. They have a very talented squad. They have an incredible array of players in all positions. And um, I think I think they should be very, very excited about uh, the years to come. Absolutely. I've said that over the, the last tournament. I remember um, I remember them saying, like, I remember the team then were saying, like, there's so much young players, like, you know, the next tournament will be will be great. And to be fair, it did, like you said, it didn't, you know, it didn't have the hardest route in the world. But regardless, I think the team. Um, I like you said. I think the next will be the World Cup next, won't it? When's what you Yeah, Qatar, Qatar, December twenty twenty two. Could be, yeah. probably still be in lockdown. Ben, of so. course. <laughs> I, I, I wonder why it was twenty two. Because I was like, yeah. I was like, oh no, obviously I forgot things were put back a year. So no, yes, um, they're I, doing it in December. It, it usually would have been in the summer, but. Uh, here's the corruption within the world and football they decided to do it in Qatar probably the hottest country in the world one of the hottest countries yeah. in the world but they have to do it in December now because it's too warm during the summer so all oh. the other leagues in, in Europe and stuff they have to rearrange their games so that FIFA and UEFA can get the World Cup played in, in, in Qatar and get a load of money yeah well as someone's been handed a lot of oil oh. so, or something yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, man. The last two of the World Cup was in Russia and Qatar. It <laughs> doesn't get much more corrupt than that. Come on. Crazy, mate. I know. I know. But um, you were saying there, obviously, 
you have a huge social media media presence and you're, you're sort of someone who's really utilised the the power of social media in the last few years like um like in the last few years your your profile and stuff has absolutely skyrocketed where you're you're doing these huge huge shows have you ever found it hard to separate we've probably sort of discussed this already where you've been able to take time out and stuff but have you been able do you find it difficult to separate yourself ben from ben nicky the the the, the online star as to say so to say yeah, I mean, do you know what? It's, a lot of people ask this, and it's something that actually has affected me in my personal life as well. Where you know, in relationships or whatever, people would be like, "Well, are you being Ben or Ben Nicky? Like, are you living up mm. to this you know, thing or whatever?" And the truth of it is, is like when I first started DJing, uh, like I was just a typical lad, like I was a normal lad, and I went out and did normal things. I got you know, got drunk, met girls, partied, loved music, loved having a good time with your mates, and I think most lads in their early twenties do that. I was just very transparent about it. I just didn't hide it. And I think, um, I think a lot of people, especially obviously, you know, you, you live and breathe trance. I think a lot of people that the trance scene had had, it didn't have much to change for a long time. It was the same headliners, same names that had been around for so long. And I think I was in the right place at the right time because I think that I, I manipulated it in a, in a way that, you know, I have always been, Grew up like probably the same as you grew up with, like Eddie Hallowell, Mauro Picardo, Scott Project, Kutsky. You know, you know um, I used to watch hip hop scratching videos. Um, you know, I came up the ranks of Jordan Suckett at the same time, so we were always like you know, doing stupid bit scratching and messing around. So I always manipulated music in my own way, and um, and I always got bored of music quite quickly. If I was playing a nine minute song, I would see the crowd leave because I was a resident DJ for a long time. So I always worked on the whole attention span thing. So a few, like once into my career, once I started, you know, getting, a few, you know, getting a few gigs here and there, I just started like kind of manipulating music into a way that was more accessible for younger people as well. Um, the majority of people liked it. Obviously some people don't like it because they like the old traditional stuff, which I get, I, you know, it, it's always going to happen, but I was bringing, I've been bringing a lot of kids into the scene, which love it or hate it. It brings money to the scene and it, it keeps everyone in, you know, in a fruitful career. So um, for me, mixing in the way that I do and, um, you know, like I, I was from trance originally and, you know, I, I kind of came from Scott Project, Organ Donors, those kind of guys were the first gigs that I played, which is more like I was always like a hard trance boy, like a reverse bass, you know, old, you know, Yoji, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I was, people don't, they don't know me, don't really know, but like they, they were my first kind of people that I started playing with and the music that I, I liked. Um, but I found myself in trance and I, I was never... Um, the best producer in the world. Like for a long time, I worked with producers to help me because my, my DJing career, like you said, it took off so much. I couldn't keep my production in, in line with my actual DJ. And so for me, I had some great people that helped me along the way. Um, as you can see now, I'm in my studio, gotten way back into it. So I'm, I'm really enjoying that. But I was always more of a DJ. My live sets, my videos, um, my videos are what really, really made my career what it was. I was just, you know, getting, I think we worked out like 60, 70 million views a year on Facebook, just on videos and um, from drop, like drops um, of like big tracks. And um, I think that brought a bit of excitement to, to the scene and, you know, whether people, you know, I understand the trance scene is quite an elitist uh, sound, uh, but you know, there's certain people that also came through the roots, you know, like say like Marlo, Vinny Vici, there were some new names that were, were, were doing different stuff, you know, it was a little bit different, which um, is, which is great to see. Um, everyone's got their place. One thing I say is everyone's got their own shelf. So everyone's got their own part in the market. And I think if Ben wasn't Ben, there would be someone else there that filling that, that gap. So I, I think it needed it. Um, and only just recently, like three or four years ago, I was saying to myself, well, I built a decent following now, but why aren't I playing the music that I truly love? Like I love trance music, but I love other stuff as well. So, um, I just started playing the stuff that I love as well like you know even even the like old classic you know like some of the older stuff like the old show tech stuff that brought up with it i would never have dropped that in a trance set before mm. um you know i i would never have played like um I, I was brought up like you know scott brown and you know stuff like in the uk hardcore scene i remember like darren styles even though he's my friend now was like one of the boys that i used to listen to his album in my car like every week so i was like Do you know what i'm gonna be true to myself so um i just started playing it all and luckily it worked for me and rather than have one core you know cater to say just trance fans i had people that love trance people that love hardcore people that love house techno uh, melbourne bounce whatever and they all kind of met in the middle so i've got like a super kind of you know people that kind of were open to other genres and um now i'd like to think that 
as much as some of my mates want to admit, I like to think I would have maybe paved and like kind of knock down a bit of a barrier for people that feel that they can't do something different. And um, I'm happy to take the brunt of the criticism for being there at the start and, you know, doing it, but I don't know, I don't know anyone um, an apology or a favor. This is my, the music that I love and that's what I do. And um, luckily the fans that come to my show love all stuff. So, you know, it's kind of, you know what you're going to get now, but um, yeah, it's um, I utilized that in a way that was, marketable and um you know I, I i worked in social media before i was a dj so i used to work with people like andy moore judge jules people like that i used to um you know work in that kind of industry so i i, I did roughly know like, how to present myself but if anyone ever wonders it's always me on social media like i know people that don't even run it themselves or they have um, people behind telling them what to say and all that but everything you see is 100 percent organic it's all me so um that's one thing that i've used Massively, especially during lockdown, like with, I've got like a VIP group for my uh, fans. It's, it's free, but it's more like, a, as we call it, misfits. Um, but it, it's just like, I think being personable shows more to your personality rather than just being like, hey, you know, I'm just, just being a bit more mundane. Yeah, but robotic, robotic, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, not, I understand that I've got some friends, some producer friends, and you, you know, as well as I do, there's some of the guys in the scene, they, they wouldn't even get a gig, you know, but they're, they're the most talented producers I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Um, that's never going to be me. You know, it's never, unfortunately, never going to be me. I love to say I'm amazing at both. It's never going to be me. But there are people that genuinely deserve more credit in the scene. But unfortunately, like, you know, like we know, it's, you've got to have everything nowadays. You've got to have the social media. You've got to have the gigs. You've got to be a good DJ. You've got to have good records. I mean, you've got to have, there's only a few DJs, I think, maybe like the, the handful out there that really get away with just one or two, um, and like I said, like people like Eddie Hallowell, who I grew up with. I mean, Eddie was just a good DJ, amazing DJ. I looked up to him so much. He came to make a few records. They weren't great, but it didn't matter because he was Eddie Hallowell. Yeah. And uh, I just feel that like I've been true to Ben now. And it, it after a long time, it, it worked. So, um, yeah, I just I just I just feel that like use utilizing social media to be true and be on. And the one thing, mate, is just to be honest, like just be, if someone asks me a question or like I ever get accused of anything, I'll just tell someone the truth. Like yes or no, like just be honest with yourself. Like I've got nothing to owe to anyone. And um, it's worked out quite well, mate. But I mean, I, I know, I'm not sure if it was yours chatting to or someone on tour at once, but I know I've got a few friends. I won't mention names, but they're scared shitless a post on social media of like, of they to say the right thing and stuff like that. Mm. So it, I, I know I'm quite, hard skinned and that and I, and I kind of know what to say um but i also know people struggle with it so i, I can understand like it's uh, it's not as easy as just you know being on social media like you have to kind of have the confidence to be able to do it as well a couple of things there you said that i, I wanted to pick up on you're completely correct uh, you have a uh, like a lot of your um <clears throat> fans and, and that type of thing they'd be a sort of a younger crowd and that is so essential for your growth as an artist and for people coming to your shows and telling their friends, oh, I'm listening to, listening to this guy, he's really, really cool because this is the generation that are going to be going to the shows and then there's another generation below them who'll be coming after them. Yeah. That's the worry for me, what I've spoken about before with the trans scene in particular. It's it's a very old scene. Um, yeah. if, if for certain countries, the crowd is, is so old. So it's it's that's a particular reason for me why you've been so successful in the last few years because you've latched... I wouldn't say that's it. probably a bit disrespectful. You've latched, latched on to see that it's so important to have a connection with that younger crowd because they're the kids on their phone, on all the apps, and who want to go to these shows so that when they see you're coming somewhere, you're going to go there 100%. I've seen your videos. So yeah, like, oh, that guy's yeah. it. We should go to that, yeah. And just another thing as well, you said that... Um, Obviously, with, with, you're somebody who has such an online presence and stuff. You obviously do get a lot of shit as well in terms yeah. of what you get off people. How does that affect you? Um, do you know? Do you know what? Like, like I used to a lot because it would be people in normally in the trance scene who would say that you're not trance, which this is fine. I'm not saying that I was, and um, so that's that's no insult to me. The only other, the only other thing I got a bit of backlash for ever was working with a co-producer, but I've been honest with that. And um, what people, if people are watching this going, oh, you know, is that bad? There is tons of people in the world. I, some of the biggest names, and I guarantee half the people that you listen to in your library have at some point worked with someone. It's pretty normal. Um, and when you are traveling, like you said, to the, the capacity that I was, 
you think I'm going to make a, 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 like a, a number one record while sat on an aeroplane. It's not as easy as it is, as it sounds. Um, so that was one thing, but, but I never, I never took, took that the wrong way because I'm honest. Um, you can quite easily see people that have helped you in your journey on Spotify, click credits. It shows you everyone that people work with. And like I said, you'd be surprised some of our favorite DJs have done it. Um, but for me now I'm in a capacity at home where I'm not touring all my, all my stuff is coming out of my studio. So, um, uh, all my all my mashups, bootlegs, everything over the years. That's always been me, regardless. That, that was always always me, um, and that's pretty much what I was known for. For doing like headfuck mashups back in the day, if you remember. So that was always from me. That was always from me. And obviously, as a DJ, you know, I mean, utilizing so many different sounds into a set is it's not an easy thing to do. Um, there's a, there's a couple of ways that I mix where you can go from having a really fast track back down to something low, which it's not very like it's like kind of a reverb trick you can do um mm-hmm. and it's a way of resetting a bpm like i'll start a, i might start a set on 150 but the next song's 138 and people go how do you do that there's a couple of little methods that i've learned and i'd like to think that my dj and um speaks for itself like i said i was brought up with people like eddie who were just djs so i never really wanted to be in the producing world but i also knew that i had to have some kind of presence in the producing world because without that you know it's it's, it's hard to get a wider reach out of uh, say the uk um, so in terms of criticism, like nowadays, I think because I'm like, I'm so honest about what I do, like, oh, your music shit. All right, cool. Like, <laughs> all right, big deal. And, I mean, and you've got to remember the bigger your fan base gets, the more kids want a reaction, the more, the more you're going to get it because you know, you're, you've got more people that, that know you. Um, so, um, nowadays, but cause I'm just a normal lad, like people don't really, I used to get a fair bit, but people just don't even bother now because I'm just like, I've got such loyal fans as well. Like they just go in on them. Mm. So I just, um, there isn't really anything you can say, like unless I like murder someone or whatever and do something really bad. Like I'm just a, a guy that plays tunes and um, I'm honest about it. And um, I manipulate music in a certain way. And yeah, I do play tracks that are really short, like two minutes long edits. That's because of what I told you before about the intention span and younger yeah. people, like uh, my sets wouldn't be what they were if I had eight minute songs. It's about being unexpected. Um, and people don't realize how hard it actually is. You'll know of this, anyone, anyone, how hard it is to keep mixing a minute, one minute songs. Like mm. I'm doing like 40 tracks in a set. Like it, you, you can't just like, like get off your headphones and just mess around. Like you are like nonstop going for it. So um, it's, it's a lot harder than people think. Um, I, I think sometimes I don't really bring up the aspect of how much work I do put into my sets. Um, I think mainly because I've got like a kind of psychology method to my sets of like how I prepare them. So that they always kind of do like kind of stand out. Um, so I'm quite protective of that. So I think that's why sometimes people think, oh, that, you know, do you just turn up and play tunes? Like, nah, I put a lot of like thought, um, into my sets. And as you'll know, you'll know more than anyone, every country has a different kind of sound yeah. that they like. So I would always tailor like some, I mean, when I go to like Bali, something like that, I'll play a really slow EDM set. And that, just because the, the fans there would want that not yeah. because I'm selfish to myself. And that's probably somewhere where we might be different, so to speak, or maybe from the more, you're more from the pure scene. I would say that there's a lot more integrity with, with like the elite scene, which I, I respect. I'll never, ever not respect that. Um, people like to, you know, someone, even like someone like Prids in the house scene would only play probably their tunes, which I totally respect, but I will honestly openly say that I am a DJ and I, I play for the people and I entertain people. So, um, that's my role, you know, like people like Steve Oki, who I'm mates with, like he, he'll openly say he throws cakes at people, but you know what, it, that, <laughs> but that, that's his job. You know what I mean? Like that's what he, he's not, he's not a credible techno DJ or, you know, trance DJ. He is an entertainer. So, you know, you can't hate someone for, if they're honest about it. Like, you know, if I was, at, if, I, if I said to you right now, I'm, a, I'm like the best trance DJ in the world, you go, Ben, you don't just play trance though, do you? Like what you want about? You know, but I would never say that. Like, I'm just me and I just do what I do. And um, I'm just Ben. Like, that's it, really. Yeah, you're completely correct, man. Like, the, like the, all we seem to do now these days is compare ourselves to other people. And it's a waste of time because every single person in this world is completely different from everyone else. You should celebrate that uniqueness. And as an artist and as a DJ, you're different to me. I'm different to you. I'm different to everyone. And we all have our own place within this scene. And, and, and that should be celebrated 100%. Yeah, I think as well, like, I don't think anyone, especially, you know, obviously know the American circuit. I don't think any like DJ really before has played, I would say, like I, I'll, in America, sometimes I'll play the bass on stage, which is the hard style stage. Then other times I'll do dream state. I, I don't think there's many DJs that have done both. So I, I think 
from doing what I've done, it's really helping people maybe go, oh, do you know what, like this, this techno project I'm doing or this hard project I'm doing, maybe I'll get accepted there as well. And I can broaden my horizons to do that. Um, there was a couple of elitist DJs back in the day that were like, well, why would you, you know, why you just, why do you still do trance music if you don't love it? I do absolutely love it, but I also love other stuff and I play all of it. And I also remember seeing some statistics from my, some of my, my streaming. Uh, what's funny, if you go to some of my big records, like my more commercial tracks on, on Spotify um, that have got millions of plays, when you click, um, you know, artists that sound like this, it goes to, it goes to trans DJs. So these young kids that listen to my tracks, they're all the actual elite trans DJs are getting plays via my younger market. So, and, and I think, I think Armin sometimes, you know, gets a bit of, you know, stick for this as well. People say, oh, he does like this pop record or whatever. But you've got to remember the lads then playing a lot of the lot of upcoming tracks from trance producers on ASOT and really helping them grow. And, you know, back back in the day, do you remember how important ASOT was for us? Yeah. It really was, yeah. Plus, man, he's doing everything he can do in trance. He always nothing yeah. to anyone within this scene. Like, the, I have so much respect for him as an artist and, and the presence that he has on stage and, and how he does that, how he go, how he just goes into that zone when he's playing on stage. He just looks like a superstar. He looks so comfortable on stage. I have so much respect for him, for how he performs and stuff. He, he, he owes nothing to anyone. Like, he, like that's the thing with this scene at times, man. You're, you're not allowed to play anything else other than trans. Like, it's, it's fucking bollocks. I love everything. I love so many other styles and I love playing them. That's how I've always been and it's always how I, I will be. I'll play different st- sounds in my set. I'm not just going to play one sound. That would bore the arse off me. I don't want to do that. So, you're dead right, man, by branching out, taking a bit from here, taking a bit from here, you get drawn influence from different places. It's the best way to be. Do you, do you, find, do you find that that is something that would affect you if you did something very different? Like, uh, Personally, well, yeah. Not really, man, because I don't read any feedback about myself, to be honest. The only thing that I really read is um, Instagram DMs. And that's only really since I started this podcast where I said, if people are struggling, if I can help you any way, message me and I'll help you. I don't read any comments about myself. I After I play somewhere or before I make a song or whatever, I know myself if I've performed to how I think I can perform. So whatever someone says about me, it's it's nothing really got to do with me. I know myself. If I'm if I think something shit, that's more to do with how I'm feeling about something in my own life or my own yeah. day rather than what that person's doing. So I, I separate the two. You know, it's quite worrying. What's quite funny is um, like the one thing that I always used to find quite strange is how people like that we do you've never met. Um, they would comment on things like they know you. <laughs> Like half these people that back in the day, I say half these people, like a few people that f- thought they were hard, would like talk like they know you. Like I would like, they probably don't know that I even know, but I would like see like my friends would send me funny stuff on that. And I'd be like, you'd be talking about like my family or like about some random thing. And I'd be like, this guy doesn't even know me. And like, what you've got to remember now, and I learned this, this is this the one reason why I don't care anymore. Well, back, back when I was getting it more is um, people literally do things to get likes so someone might say your record's shit someone might say you're a shit dj someone might insult you but half the time it's just because like they look cool and it gets loads of likes and all that does is makes them feel better if you what's funny right is a couple of people back like five years ago like it said about when i was really going through that transition of just but not being just trance i was doing everything but i was still in trance or whatever um some of the people i click the button it says they follow me or I look at the DM, you know, like you can on Instagram, you can open the press message and it'll show DM. It was like, hey, bro, love your stuff. Would love to meet you. This is like a month before we said it. So I'm like, you obviously just a little bit like envious or, you know, or just being a bit sour. So, um, yeah, that is, um, that's it all. I'm a- I actually, I don't even know. This podcast will go out in time, actually. So I've actually started um, following on from Chance um, back when I used to do more of the headfuck stuff where it's like bootlegs, mashups, um, a little bit of a quicker mix in, not too crazy like I would in my normal set, but, you know, just quick kind of energy kind of thing. Um, I start a new brand. It's called Emotional Havoc. Um, and it's basically like another kind of way of saying head fuck. But head fuck, unfortunately, as much as it was good back in the day, the swear word on Facebook, I couldn't advertise it. <laughs> Is it you know, it's like it would just like reject your advert, like if I promote an event. So um, it's called Emotional Havoc. And um, I can't. When does this podcast go out? Because when was um, it? will. What day is it? The, we're recording today. It's the 15th. It will probably go out maybe around the 20th, 20th July, oh, maybe cool. mid Anyways, next week. Yeah, yeah. So by the time you guys have watched this, yeah. So the yeah. first, um, 
the first, I'm only going to do three, like maybe between three and seven a year of these trance only sets, even though I do play loads of it in my sets anyway. Um, but it will be uh, ASOT Moscow closing set. So that'd be the first one. Just want to keep it to the big ones only. So um, yeah, I just, it's going to be exciting. Um, and it also gives people who maybe followed me back then and don't feel that I always just play that in my sets an opportunity to come and see me do just that. Um, I think ASOT 850 was it main stage that I did. I think that was the last time that I really felt like I turn up and still put on a show for that sound that I truly love. So yeah, it's exciting, man. Like, I think it's, um, I think, um, being able to go into a full trance set, but then go and do something totally different the week after. Um, I just, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. I don't feel like I've got limit, like a, like a sword over me and, you know, so I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. That's cool, man. That's cool. And it's something else just I'm, I'm picking up on. Um, you spoke about the psychology that goes into your sets. I, I remember I saw something that you posted. I think you were on tour or something a few years ago and you were reading a book. It was about NLP. It was like neuro, neuro-linguistic programming. So yeah. I get the feeling that like psychology and these type of things is something that interests you because this is all stuff that I've... Um, I've been reading all this sort of stuff for years. I don't really read anymore, but there were certain times where I felt like I needed to sort of learn. I wanted to educate myself and to learn how to do things better. So like NLP, Neuro Linguistic Program, it's a way of like how you organize your thinking and your feeling and the language that you use and your behavior and it, the results that it brings out. Um, so what sort of um, experience do you have with that sort of thing? I'm really interested to hear that type of thing because it's for yeah. me, I'm interested and so I'm good to hear other people are as well. I, I think mainly what it was is um, coming, I think the best thing that I did was being a resident DJ for four years in a, in a super club because I was having to play different sets to different people and just all I, the, the, the way that I come around to mixing the way that I do wasn't like, I didn't choose it. What would happen is when I'm playing, um, Syndicate Bristol, you would have played there. That's where me and Jordan exactly started our careers. Um, when you're, you know, playing the, the graveyard slot as we know, and everyone's about to leave, I would play a track. I'd see people start to leave, and I would get anxiety. I'd be like, in my head, I'd be like, if I can win that person back, that shows that my music has changed them, their mood. Uh, every week, I would play these tunes, and I'd mix in a certain way, and I have certain records that would work every time. And I'd notice these people were going to leave. I'd drop a track, and they go, "Oh shit, I'm staying now." So that mindset was constantly on my mind and obviously becoming a headline DJ and playing these big shows. There was, there's, it, there's a, there's a moment at transmission Sydney where I played, I ended quite on a hard, a hardest, I, even though it was a trance a festival, I ended on like some harder stuff. And I remember just thinking like this mix that I'm going to do is going to be a danger mix where I don't know if it's going to work. I'm going to get it obviously in time, but like the key, the, it wasn't the right key. And I was like, I'm going to whack this track in. And I, I, I am sometimes more worried about getting a track in quicker so that people stay than the mix itself. And that's one thing I've always wanted to explain. I could always wait four more minutes. I always could for the outro. But to me, it's more important than getting that track in there and then so that the crowd have that experience. Um, so you know, sometimes you think, oh, I could have done a sick mix then. It could have been like a perfect flow. I'm very well aware of that. I could easily wait four more minutes, but everything that I've done has been purely for a live aspect. Um, and I've, I've learned to mix very quickly and obviously you, you know, it's like you size mixing key and stuff like that, but I, I would call it like very like in and out mixing. Um, and it worked with the style that I do, but I think other than that, the main thing that I really learned was like, I think I, when I, I think I was playing after someone like Armin or someone in the Arbitra or high or somewhere. Um, and he ended, he ended on, I, I planned my set. Like I always plan the first three tracks. I'm like, I think these will go off. You know what it's like. You get the first intro ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I just go with the flow. And I think he end. I thought I would end on like one forty. He ended on one sixty on some of my hard star remix. And I was mm. like, oh no, like, what am I going to do? It's five a.m. in the morning. And I've heard about this reset thing. Like you know, you put the brain resets. And I've been doing it for a while. Where if and this is why bands actually have a gap at concerts. Never realised that. I never knew that. If the brain has longer than like 18 seconds to reset, they forget what BPM they were left at. So I was like, you know what? I don't need to go faster than 160. I can just wait or start with an anthem. So I remember it sounds stupid. I had a bootleg of the rude sandstorm or no, it was insomnia, something like that. I was like, go in with the hits. It's like late. Everyone, everyone wants something to remember. So I just started with it. And I remember everyone rather than leave, oh, the energy's lower. I went straight in with a riff and everyone was like, ah, oh, rememberable. So there's just certain little things like moments and ways of preparing for sets and 
using familiarity um the, the psychology of it i know it's like in my brain but it's really hard to come across on this podcast what i do because it's just like um i strongly believe it's like a sixth sense like it's something that i've just learned naturally to do by being in front of so many people for so long um and i'm sure you're the same there's times where i bet in your head you go i need to drop this track right now because I'm always yeah. sort of thinking two, two, three tracks ahead where I know, yeah. because I'm always watching what's going on to, to see what energy, if I need to change the energy and stuff. But one thing I've really learned over the past year or eight, since from, from the streams that I've done, etc., people just want to hear music that they know, man. And like, if you play a big gig and you're playing like an hour of brand new music, which is something I love doing, the fact is probably 5% of the people there are are genuinely loving that whereas 95% of the people at a gig they just want to hear good music and have a good time so it's something that I'm going to sort of remember moving forward especially as the gigs do come back obviously I'll always have that where myself where I want to play new music and make new music and sort of educate people all that that yeah. shit you know what I mean but yeah. um people just want to hear that's another reason why you've probably been very successful in the past few years because you play stuff that people want to hear and you give them a good yeah. time and they go home after enjoying themselves and and that ultimately is what this is all about someone said to me once he said um you're just a crowd pleaser and i said well i've done my job then yeah exactly <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, what, yeah what do you want me to do like like i said before is um i'm there's a place for everyone like without some of you guys like you know there's there's tracks that i would never have heard you know like I mean, exactly was one of my favorite tracks mm. when i was younger like things like that there's there's certain things i wouldn't have heard without armin you wouldn't have you know the platform for say a sort of things like that and i think on the edge of trance there isn't many people well there is no one that's done what i've done i hate saying things like because i hate talking about myself yeah yeah, but, yeah but if that makes sense like you know there's no one that's done that route and that's why i am who i am and um and i and i think within all of us which is one thing i know especially being very big in belfast is one thing i noticed is that with with the older generation having kids and younger kids is a lot of the dads now obviously are installed in trance whether and when i say trance i don't mean they know the latest beatport 10 i mean these are people that love like delirium silence cafe over term or tom craft or stuff yeah, yeah that's exactly. on yeah, the yeah. beach York, you yeah, know all yeah. these things that everyone loves up here so I now find that that knowledge is that now going that their kids are like 18 going into my concerts and like, mate, I grew up on this. That's so mm -hmm. I feel like you, you're kind of educating. I obviously got a very big older market as well, especially in the UK. Um, there's groups like Cleanfield social and that, like, um, there's a cut, some really good groups on Facebook that really support me massively. And, um, and I, and I think one thing that someone said to me that stuck out a lot was, a lot of the big festivals, especially in the UK, that, you know, no one's really ever supported a UK act from our scene. When I say our, I mean like trance, hard dance, whatever. And I think now is the time. I think now is the time for, you know, whether it's myself or someone else, like, you know, put the, I put the work in, you know, done the ticket sales, like done, you know, got the, the fan base there. And I think it's time now that someone has the opportunity to really bring through the other, you know, bring, bring through everyone else because and obviously people like Armin and stuff, you know, they, you know, they, they've been having that rain for a long time. And in the UK, it'd be nice if some of us had to do that as well. And um, yeah, I just think it's space for everyone, but I, it would just be nice to see boys. I don't care whether it's me or whatever, just have, you know, start to get a bit more of this sound back. Cause I, I, if you listen to the charts, I was listening to a Gala record called Wish You Well with Becky Hill, really commercial record on the radio. It's basically slowed down trance on the radio. Like, and it, and it was number one in the UK charts for a long time. And I think a lot of people take an influence. Um, everyone's Same with techno, techno scene at the moment. Uh, all the drum code stuff, all that type, all Space 92, Yellowheads, it's trance, man. It's all arpeggiated rifts, which was there with techie beats. Mario Bocato said it as well on the podcast when he was on with me. They're basically, it's just like a, it's a 2021 version of BXR Records is what a lot of the techno stuff is now. And for me, it's, it's amazing for me because I love all that stuff. But... Um, you're completely correct. There's, there's the influence. There's always going to be influence of because trance is so melodic. It's going to influence other genres, and it's it's great to see. That should be genre at all. Like people understand. Like if you turn up and drop like an organ donors track or like a you know an old show type track, that 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 in the back in the day is classed as hard trance. You know the word is in in the genre. The word is there trance. So if someone turns up and drops like a one fifty absolutely banging old hard trance track, there's there's no reason why. That isn't, you know, that, that that's you know, what's wrong with playing that. It's still under the umbrella of that genre. It's it's so varied. Just before I go, um, 
are you hopeful and optimistic for the remaining uh, months of this year? Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, as much, I am hopeful and I do think things will go ahead. I do think testing is going to be brought in. I think even next week when things reopen, I think we're going to have to have some kind of testing. Now, based on what I saw going to the England match and how easy it was for me to get a test, it's going to be, it ain't going to stop things spreading at all. It's, it's, it seems to be pretty easy. I mean, you, you just scan the barcode of your test at home, but you know, you could just pour water on it, mm. but we're not giving anyone any tips out there how to do it. But, but, but in honesty, I mean, it would be very easy to, to, you know, not have a proper test. So I don't really understand. I, I think people should just take responsibility. Maybe just do it, you do it because they don't want to get sick before they come to a show and just um, crack on. So I think, I think we're going to have a good run here. Um, only thing that worries me, I think the club and scene will be held responsible if cases go crazy. That's what I'm worried about. And I think we'll be the first people to go get locked back down and, and stop work. So I don't want to be negative about it. I'm going to crack on with it and hopefully it will be fine. But um, we need to get some kind of normality back and we need to accept this isn't going to go. Um, if we can, you know, if we can limit, you know, if you, if you're worried or you don't want to get anything or whatever, you know, like I said before, is, is there's loads, there's so many ways of not being around people. Um, but for us that are willing to take that risk or for us that I say, have a, have a vaccine, you know, apparently that was the way out of this, or for us that are willing to go to work because we have to work, then we, we should be, have the right to be able to work and be able to go out. And I'm hoping that this will, this will, this will be it, but let's see, man. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, ben, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Pleasure. I wish pleasure. you all the best for the, the rest of the year. Hope the Greeks go great. I will now. see you somewhere on the road as well. Hope hopefully. so. Hope okay. so, man. Hope so, man. Thank you very much. Take care, man. No worries, buddy.